Alright, so in this video we're going to take a look at two-dimensional CVAT, so looking at projectile motion and motion on slopes. So before I get started, it's really important that you know two things already. One, that you are able to resolve vectors into perpendicular components. If not, go back and look at my video on that. And you should be able to apply CVAT equations in one dimension. Again, um, you want, might want to tackle some of those problems like free fall problems, that kind of thing, before you get started on this. Okay, so before we get to slopes, let's start off on projectile motion. There's a couple of important things to know when we're dealing with two dimensions. Remember, forces and accelerations can't have any impact on velocity perpendicular to it, because it would be multiplied by cosine of 90, which is zero. So you have a force acting vertically downwards and a velocity um, horizontally, for instance, the acceleration cannot have any impact on that velocity. It can affect the vertical velocity, but not the horizontal velocity. That's really important that you remember. Um, when we're dealing with projectile motion, we typically will resolve any properties that you have into horizontal and vertical components. Just by convention, there'll be the odd occasion that doesn't make sense or there's a better way of doing it. Um, but with projectile motion especially, typically we resolve vertically and horizontally before we even get started on the problem. So let's see how that works. So what we've got, a uh, very standard 2D CVAT type problem, we've got a cannon and it's going at um, 10 meters per second. It's the second at an angle of 20 degrees, so let's put that in there. To the horizontal. Determine the range of the cannon. Um, so essentially the horizontal distance at which the ball will return to the ground. So if we think about its motion, what it's going to do is essentially look wee, and at some point it's going to come back to the ground and we know that that's going to be knocking back to where it was fired from. And then what we're going to do is work out the time taken for that to occur. So actually we're going to do it the other that the other way around. The first thing we need to do is work out the time, and then we will solve to find the distance. Okay, so as I said before, it's really important that we essentially split horizontal and um, like vertical stuff. So if we resolve vertically, that's what the symbol means. Um, so the velocity Actually, I should give it the symbol u because it's the initial velocity. Initial velocity in the vertical direction is going to be 10 sine 20 or cosine of 70, I suppose we could write. Um, the, the acceleration in that direction is going to be minus g because it's in the opposite direction to the motion. And when it returns to the ground, the displacement is going to be 0. So we've got u, a, s, and t, um, or when we want to solve for t. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the equation that combines those four together. Squared. Um, and then we know that, for instance, s is zero, um, so we can flip things around a bit, and we also know that a is minus g, so we know that uh, ut minus a half gt squared is equal to zero, uh, so we can cancel out t's at this point, we divide both sides by t, and then we end up with an expression up here, so we know that u minus a half g t is equal to zero, and we want to find the time, uh, so it's, we'll take the half g t to the other side, times by two, to get rid of the half, divide by g, and that should give you t, uh, which is going to be t one because that's your g. So let's calculate that. 2 times 10 times uh, sine 20, uh, making sure you're in degrees, divided by 9.81 gives you 
seven zero seconds. So that's what the time it takes to return to the ground. And what we're going to do at this point is resolve horizontally so we can see how far. Um, so u in the horizontal direction is 10 cosine 20. Now we know the acceleration in the horizontal direction is zero because there's no force acting that way. Um, so essentially we know that the horizontal distance is just going to be uh, ut because a is zero to so the half 80 squared is zero which is just it's 0.697 is the time unrounded times by 10 cosine 20 which is your u so times by 10 times cosine of 20 so the range of your cannon in the horizontal direction is 6.6 uh, 6 meters there and that's the first part so we've got the time it takes to return to ground here and we've got the, dis the horizontal displacement the range of your cannon so that's how far away essentially the ball would hit the ground okay so that's an example of using projectile motion and very typically we will separate out um, horizontally and vertically because gravity acts vertically and not horizontally so that's very useful to us. So project Slopes we treat slightly differently so instead of resolving horizontally and vertically or in the x and y directions what we do is we resolve parallel and perpendicular to the slope. Now the best way to show you what that means is to show you an example. So we've got a box um, sitting on a slope, so we've got a slope, there is the horizontal, and it's telling you it's at 30 degrees, and it says there's a 5 kilogram box, which means um, there's an acceleration, uh, sorry, a force of 5g acting vertically down, there's a weight force. And what we're going to do, want to do is determine the acceleration of the object and the speed of the object after it's travelled three metres. So the key thing to realise here is the box is free to move in this line of motion here. It can't move into or out of the slope. Because, so that's why we resolve parallel, which is this direction, and perpendicular, because it's free to move in the parallel direction. So let's build ourselves a vector triangle. So we've got the weight force, which is 5g. Now what we're going to do is we're going to split that up into perpendicular components, one of which will be parallel to the slope, and one of which will be perpendicular, just like that. Um, so if we sketch where the slope is, in this diagram here, we know that that angle there is 30 degrees, you know, these are right angles, so we always split it up into perpendicular components, which we know means we know that that one's 60 degrees, that one is 30 degrees. Okay, so the force parallel to the slope is going to be 5g sine 30. Why sine 30? Because it's the side opposite the 30 degree angle, so you're using your sine function which means the acceleration parallel is going, to, is going to be the force parallel divided by the mass 5g sine 30 obviously divided by 5 so it's just going to be g sine 30 and this happens typically um, with any slope question you end up getting an, an expression for the acceleration and it wants to know the speed of the object after it has travelled three metres. So it's sitting, so that tells you it's stationary. So we know that So the u parallel is zero. We know the displacement parallel, I'll have to call it s, is three. We know the acceleration is g sine 30, and we're trying to get what that is. So we need an expression with all of those is, so that's going to be 
uh, v squared is u squared plus 2as, um, which means that v is going to be the square root, because u is 0, of 2 times by g sine 30, which is a, times by 3, which is the displacement. So let's plug that into the old calculator. 2 times 9.81 times sine 30 times by 3, square root of answer is 5.4 meters per second. So let's highlight that one. So that's going to be the velocity parallel to slope, and that's the direction it's going to move parallel to the slope. Okay, so those are just two examples. You're going to need lots more practice at lots of different types, different types of questions. But those are the two general principles for dealing with projectile motion and with slopes.